Hello. Today I want to talk about Wilhelm Wundt, regarded by many as the founder of modern academic psychology. This is the first of two videos on Wundt. Wundt was born in 1832 in a village near Mannheim, in what was then the Grand Duchy of Baden, in southwestern Germany. The son of a village Lutheran pastor, he apparently showed no signs of intellectual ability as a child and was a daydreamer in class. But after his father died and he realized that his family didn't have enough money to put him through university, he became a star student. Attending the University of Heidelberg, he ranked first in the state medical exams in 1855, but he also discovered that he didn't enjoy clinical practice. Instead, he loved science and research, and after a semester at the University of Berlin under Johannes Muller and Emile dubois Raymond, was appointed lecturer in physiology at the University of Heidelberg in 1857. His background in physiology was strengthened in 1858 when the great Helmholtz became the director of the Heidelberg Physiological Institute and Wundt became his poorly paid lab assistant uh, until Helmholtz's departure in 1871. Wundt was a workaholic and already writing and in an audacious 1862 work, Contributions to the Theory of Sensory Perception, threw down a challenge to his seniors asserting that psychology could only become a science if it was based on experimental findings and that the mind could indeed be investigated experimentally. He was then only 30. Several more books followed, notably his two-volume tome, Principles of Physiological Psychology, in 1873-74. This finally established him as an important figure in the field, and after briefly occupying the chair in inductive philosophy at the University of Zurich, in Switzerland, he became professor of philosophy at the more prestigious University of Leipzig in Saxony in 1875. He was then in his early 40s. It was at Leipzig that he became famous, eventually attracting students from all over Germany and even several from overseas, notably the United States, then with many expanding universities and a widespread respect for German scholarship. Wundt remained at Leipzig until his retirement in 1917, at the age of 85, and continued to publish almost until his death in 1920, at the age of 88. The full extent of his output was enormous, and it has been estimated that his published writings amount to over 53,000 pages. It is unlikely that anyone now living has ever read his entire corpus. Wundt is now justly celebrated for what he did rather than what he wrote. As we have seen in the previous lecture, before Wundt there were a series of distinguished scholars, Muller, Weber, Helmholtz, Donders and Fechner, who advanced what we would now call physiological psychology. Wundt built on their work, but he also transformed its significance. Apart from Fechner, with his psychophysics, the others had seen themselves as physiologists first and foremost. They acknowledged the importance of the German philosophical traditions and sometimes made explicit reference to them, but they regarded themselves as scientists rather than philosophers. In this regard, Wundt was following a different path, distinguishing his experimental psychology both from physiology and established academic philosophy. At the same time, however, he insisted that ultimately psychology formed the basis for a new reworking of philosophy. The philosophers rejected this claim, but Wundt did succeed in establishing the intellectual independence of psychology. So from this time onwards we can talk properly about academic psychology rather than about philosophical or physiological approaches to psychological questions. In practical terms, Wundt also established the independence of academic psychology from both physiology and philosophy. In appointing him, the University of Leipzig had already acknowledged that he was going to bring his own distinctive approach to his work. Thus, a separate room was set aside for him to store the apparatus he needed for his experiments and in which to conduct a psychology practicum. Teaching a growing number of undergraduate and graduate students and writing extensively, he came to define what psychology was. He defined a new domain of science and drew its intellectual map. 
In time, a small but growing number of thinkers disagreed with his ideas and argued against them. But for many, he had established the basic paradigm of what psychology was. Again, he initiated the first proper psychology journal, Philosophical Studies, in 1881, the choice of name reflecting his sustained view that psychology was essentially empirical philosophy. Importantly, he attracted large numbers of graduate students. He sponsored 186 doctoral dissertations altogether, approximately two-thirds of which were on psychological topics, with the remaining third focused on philosophy. This represented an enormous amount of work, but it meant that he was the main person in training up the first two generations of lecturers in psychology in both Germany and the United States, including some men who became eminent in their own right. A distinct school of Wundtian psychology emerged as a result. Part of his approach was a very precise definition of what constituted experimental evidence in psychology and which he insisted his graduate students follow. This served both to define his school quite closely and also to provide a model for other psychology laboratories that were established elsewhere. Before discussing Wundt's specific interpretation of psychology in the next video, let me turn to the question of the date of psychology's establishment as a new and separate discipline. Some authors, including Morton Hunt, whose book I am using as the textbook for this course, opt for December 1879, when Wundt's first doctoral student in psychology began collecting his research data in Wundt's small research lab. Others, including myself, prefer to choose 1875 as the birth year of academic psychology, this being the year in which both Wundt began his work at Leipzig and William James began to teach psychology at Harvard, again with a small research lab set aside for his use. Such arguments are pedantic, of course, and it is really easier to see the birth of psychology as a process rather than a single event. From this standpoint, we can see a series of significant moments in the emergence of modern psychology, starting with Weber's work on the perception of sensory differences in the 1830s, and continuing on through the work of Helmholtz, Fechner and Donders in the 1850s and 1860s. Again, whilst the 1870s were the crucial time for the birth of psychology, both Wundt and James continued to do crucial work in the years that followed, and the process in which psychology developed as a separate discipline continued over at least the next two decades with such events as the appointment of specially designated professors of psychology, the establishment of more scholarly journals, and the formation of scholarly associations and institutes dedicated to psychology. Thank you.